Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Dead Bait Fishing for King Mackerel. I'm going to be talking to Captain Jim Sabella of Plan 9 Fishing Charters, working out of the Topsail, Hampstead, Wrightsville Beach area. We're going to be talking about gear and rigs and downriggers and bait choices and time of year, everything you need to know to catch King Mackerel with dead bait. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post and this newly formed saltwater podcast series. It is in this podcast series where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights, their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often, albeit the higher goal is to give you confidence and enthusiasm to get yourself and your friends out on the water and spend more time together more often on the water. I'm joined in this podcast endeavor every episode with my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Welcome back, Billy. What's up, Gary, man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Looking good. Um, good to see you too, man. Happy to be talking fishing. Happy to be doing the podcast. Getting a lot of good positive feedback on the podcast, and that fuels me to do more, you know, get continue the guests, the topics, and, uh, and deal them up with you. Yeah, man. It's fun, dude. Learning a lot along the way. So we really appreciate everybody checking it out. Uh, subscribing, uh, as I mentioned in a previous episode, Apple has a different way of subscribing now. So make sure if you uh, haven't, make sure you hit that little uh, subscribe check box up in the top right hand corner uh, when you have our stuff brought up on the Apple uh, podcast app. Anyway, enough of that stuff. Let's talk about the people who make this possible, which is our awesome sponsor. So I want to give a shout out real quick to uh, Marine Warehouse Center. I got a quick message from them and we'll be right back. At Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats, we have parts, we have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water, and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. Boom. Those guys love the water, Gary. Got a new ad in there. I love it. Yeah, man, you get to hear Emmett talk, you get to hear Terrell talk, and I was waiting for him to say one of the best things is I get to tell jokes to the people oh. that come in the store, and that didn't make the commercial. I'll, I'll have to touch base with him because he's certainly still telling me jokes. That's funny, man. Well, I'm going to let you tell that joke, or repeat the joke, I should say, right after I promote our other sponsor, which is R.A. Hitch, Raleigh Apex Hitch. They got hitches, trailers, bike racks, all kinds of stuff for the outdoors person. Uh, if you need your uh, setup rigged out, they are the people to do it. So make sure you contact Chris and his team. Um, big fans of the podcast. Chris is a fisherman, so we really appreciate those guys supporting the show. And Chris hasn't told you any bad jokes, so we'll take it back to Terrell's <laughs> bad joke, Gary. I'm excited to hear it. Um, Chris has not told me any bad jokes, but maybe we can solve that when Chris and I go fishing because what Chris – as we've mentioned before on the show, when he invites me to go fishing, like I pretty much show up. It's not like, I just think he's being nice. I, I show up, but yes, Terrell with the joke. And again, you're a bigger fan of his jokes than me. So you let me know what you think. Again, Terrell's joke, not mine. How many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 10 tickles tentacles <laughs> tentacles where's my money button here man wow i need some sound effects loaded up dude that's pretty funny i like octopus so good for good job terrell that's a good one that's funny mm, all right I know, I know gary didn't help that with you with that at all so it's too much fun no. man too much fun all right gary, fish you photo want to, you want to see a fish photo i got Absolutely. one for you here we go. We got Jaden Cook with his first king mackerel. It was caught on a live bait just off Atlantic Beach. That thing was so big, it had to crop in the picture a little bit. Uh, good, good job, <laughs> Jaden. Yeah, man. King mackerel, a good way to get anglers out there fishing, man. Get them trolling, get them catching. Good for him. Good for little man holding up that big fish on the front of the boat. 
Yeah, man, somebody should buy him a coffee right after they buy us a coffee. <laughs> I'm getting terrible. I need to work on my segues. I need, I need to That's just them. laziness. That was lazy segue. <laughs> yeah, because nobody wants to buy Jaden a coffee. I'm over <laughs> here dealing with Terrell's jokes, and you're lazily <laughs> saying, hey, let me buy you a coffee. <laughs> somebody can buy us a coffee. If you enjoy the podcast, if you enjoy what Gary and I are doing, head over to buymeacoffee.com slash Fisherman's Post. And, uh, and buy Gary and I a coffee. We enjoy, I'm drinking uh, bubbly water right now, but I enjoy coffee. I don't have any because he hasn't bought any. But anyway, Gary, Gary drinks trash coffee. So you can buy him like four coffees when you buy one. <laughs> well, if we were following the new show notes, Billy, it says oh. talk less about buy me oh. a coffee oh, so yeah. that you have time, so that Billy has time to say, hey, or consider sponsoring the show yeah that's but right. i mean you can you can recycle jokes about me buying crappy coffee that i mean that's i'm sure people enjoy that too you know what gary does buy crappy coffee <laughs> but he encourages me to reach out to good sponsors and so that's what i'm doing right now uh, if you want to be a sponsor of the show absolutely feel free to reach out to us my contact information is in the show notes uh, so if you want to see your business logo on here or you want us to make bad jokes about or make stuff up about you, please reach out to us. <laughs> we'll definitely incorporate that into the show. Anyway. And the show. And a reminder, the show ends, as it ends all the time, with Billy's best takeaway. So joking aside on lazy segue and failure to mention sponsor of the show, Billy, home run at the end of the me talking with Captain Jim Sabella, Billy's best takeaway. I'm excited, Gary. I'll see you guys on the other side. All right, so now I'd like to welcome to the show Captain Jim Sabella of Plan 9 Fishing Charters, talking about dead bait fishing for king mackerel, gear, rigs, downriggers, bait choices, and time of year. Welcome to the show, Jim. Pleasure to have you. Thanks, Gary. I appreciate it. Good to see you, Billy. I appreciate you having me here. A return guest, so you know the deal. The deal is we got two questions for you before we get to the main event. Two questions. The first one, as you could predict, is why... Should we listen to anything you have to say about a king mackerel? Well, I've been fishing the Carolina coast for over 20 years. Uh, I've been doing a lot of, most of my fishing is for king mackerel, uh, Spanish mackerel, stuff like that, mahi. Uh, these are all fish that you can catch at the same time doing the same thing. You can modify these rigs. And this is something that I've uh, really spent my time uh, honing my skill on. To number two. And with Don't start worry. when I'm ready. All right, acceptable answer. That brings me to question number two, traditionally a non-fishing related question. And on your answer here, I don't want you to be shy. I don't want you to be timid. I want you to go for it, okay? Don't hold back. How does the Urban Dictionary define dead bait? If you were to look up dead bait on the Urban Dictionary, what's your guess as to what it says? It's probably got something to do with a uh, sexual connotation. I would probably say something to do with <laughs> something that a woman doesn't want to do or something. <laughs> Shame on you. Get your mind out of the gutter. It just says men or women in clubs that aren't fun to talk to. They're dead bait. I mean, why does it have to be about sex with you, Sabella? Jesus. This is a fishing podcast. <laughs> Sabella, let's talk about dead bait fishing for king mackerel. Now, I reached out to you. We decided on this because this is an area that you like. You specifically like the dead bait. So I tell you what, before we go into gear, give me the quick on why you're a fan of dead bait for king mackerel versus some of the other methods, and then we'll get into the dead bait technique. Okay. I like the dead bait method for a few reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about trying to find that bait either before my charter or with my charter, I can just go right out and start fishing. Uh, it's easy. It doesn't require a lot of uh, preparation. Uh, and it's just, for me, it's mostly, I can put in the most amount of fishing time ready to go without having to do all the other little things. All right. Um, I'm in on that. So let's talk about it. So before we get to rigs, I think we said we're going to talk about gear. So let's talk about some gear choices. Like, what do you like? Okay, so I brought something here uh, just to show. All right, let's see if we can pull this off. We are. Okay, uh, this is a live bait style rod uh, with a with a this is a Speedmaster reel. You don't have to use Speedmaster, but this reel holds uh, three hundred yards of twenty pound test. 
Uh, I've got it loaded with braid with a top shot of mono. So I can put on like, I probably got about 550, 600 yards of line on here. When you figure in the braid with the mono, uh, a lot of line, uh, it's a fast taper rod. Uh, I can use this rod for live or dead bait. Um, it's a very versatile rod. This is a six and a half footer. I like a little bit shorter rod, just it's easier to control around the boat. Uh, fast taper, 15 to 30 pound class. And what is fast taper for the, those of us that are still working on our fishing vocabulary? So the fast taper means that your bend mostly happens in the upper quarter of the rod. And why is that important? Uh, it gives you a little bit of uh, more shock absorption. Uh, it gives the, uh, the, the, a little bit less, uh, pressure on the fish. And when you're fishing, uh, with this type of gear, you don't have your drag set really, really hard. So you want to let the rod be beat the fish up less than in trying to put a lot of pressure on the fish because you're using small hooks. So the softer tip, the faster tip allows the fish to fight the tip, not necessarily to put a lot of pressure where you could pull that hook out. And uh, another follow-up question, man, you were saying like with the braid and the mono, you get to about 500 or so. If it was just mono, it'd be more like 300. Is there a min for people who are wanting to be set up, is there like a minimum you would say, like have at least 300 yards or 200 Three, yards or four? What is it that you would 300, say? 300 yards, it would be plenty. Uh, with the with uh, with the boat that you have, you can chase down the fish. Uh, but, you know, if you want to, you know, you, they're, you're not dealing with a fish that's going to run a thousand yards out and you do have, you are in a boat, so you're able to chase the fish down if you start to get down on it. So 300 yards is, is plenty. And another question, sorry to belabor this, is the standard sort of like fast taper rod a six and a half or is the standard seven, you got to look a little bit harder for six and a half? Uh, you find them pretty regularly, six and a half to seven foot. So it's just a personal preference on the shorter rod for me. You know, they're available just as readily. And, you know, you just sometimes have to ask. And your purpose for that is it's just easier for an angler to navigate. A shorter rod is just more, less, you're going to be more clumsy with the seven foot than the six and a half. Is that the purpose? Uh, so for me, uh, I like to get the fish in close to the boat. When you have a shorter rod, it's easier to control that fish when it gets closer to the boat. And I want to be right there. I want to. I want that fish right next to the boat. It's. I. It's sometimes if you have a large, longer rod, you can get a little bit uh, tougher to get them to maneuver the fish closer to the boat. Okay, so let's go to gear then, man. That's a. That was a solid. I mean, let's go to rigs. That was a solid gear conversation. Okay, so the rigs, uh, they do make specific dead bait rigs. Uh, on this rod here, I have uh, a pretty standard dead bait rig. It's a, uh, a jig head, half ounce. Uh, I always fish uh, a skirt on my rigs because I'm trying to maybe add some flash because the bait doesn't have the same way that it looks when it's alive. So I want to add some flash, something to give you some flair, something to see that bait. Uh, then it goes to a treble hook, uh, which is a pretty standard rig. Uh, then here I have a little bit different bait. This one here is a more like a swimming head. This is a blue water candy uh, dead bait rig. Uh, I've got a bait on here so you can see how the bait looks when you have it rigged up. I like to leave my hook on the back free swinging so that it has a chance to catch the fish. All right. So I'm going to interject here. We can't see it in the camera shot. Okay. So if you would do two things, because we got people who watch and we got people who listen. So hold it up so we can get a video, a visual for those watching. And then, and then give me a, the description again for those that are listening and not able to watch. Okay. It's better. In the a little bit higher. Okay. Right there. Yeah, man. So this is a blue water candy dead bait rig. Okay. It's a swimming head. So it'll give the bait a little bit more activity. Uh, it also uses a, a, a straight up hook with a stinger hook on the back. I've rigged a bait on here to show you uh, how I rig my baits and how to rig a bait on uh, either a dead bait rig or this rig. And 
um, I like to leave my trailing hook free swinging. Uh, it lets the bait swim better, and also it gives you more of a chance to hook the fish uh, when it comes up. But like when you're trolling, this this hook actually lays right back behind the bait, right in along that line. So just a couple of inches or even an inch off the length of the bait, is that what you that rig's designed to yes. lay? Yes, I like to have my hooks stick just a slight bit back behind the bait so that it doesn't impede the the action of the bait talk to me more about a swimming head like what is that what is that and how it, and the effect it gives it so if you look at it I'm holding it straight on and i'm holding it on the side this digs down a little bit more and it will actually get a little bit of side to side action so that it gives the bait a more realistic life lifelike look uh when you have the other head uh they still get a little bit of swim, but they're not moving as good with this. They pretty much so stay in a straight line. Um, you get a little bit of wiggle, but that gives the uh, the swimming head gives the tail a little bit more wiggle and a little bit more life. So with those heads, now if I'm going to push you to talk about color and flash, no flash, or just all the different choices, because, I mean, all of us have experienced, man, you can go into a tackle shop and they've got how many choices available but for most of us, I mean, we don't want one of everything. We just want a couple that, you know, we believe give us a good shot. What's, what's your thought there? So pretty much so I have both the main colors that I like to fish. Uh, this one, uh, chartreuse, any sort of lime green that I really, really like. It, it detracts a lot of fish. The other one, this one here, that's a pink skirt. I really like pink. Those are the two colors that I fish. I'll always have a, a chartreuse green and a pink in my spread. You could get some darker colors, like if you're fishing on a cloudy day, sometimes like a purple or uh, even like a purple and black work really well. Uh, but a lot of it is uh, personal preference. Um, there's also, if you start playing the color spectrum and stuff like that, uh, you know, as you go down deeper, you lose different colors and pink stays a little bit better than some of the other colors in the spectrum. And then what about plastic skirt versus just a more of a flash kind of skirt? Does that matter to you? I like the flashy skirts a lot when I'm fishing down especially like on my downrigger or something where it's going down. I like a flashier skirt because it gives a more lifelike look to the bait. Um, if you look at a live fish, it's got a lot of iridescence to it. And that's why I like uh, a flash, you know, those types of skirts. Man, uh, what have we not said about rigs? I mean, it seems like we've had a pretty straightforward conversation, but I don't want to move on too quickly. Uh, uh, swivels as small as possible and this, these rigs are on wire so that's another thing you know you're going to be using wire for king mackerel fishing on these dead bait rigs so from the swivel the wire is about three feet about three feet a specific wire man people love specifics okay i personally like a stranded wire like a seven strand you need a 30 or 40 pound test uh because it's a little bit limper and uh it doesn't kink up as easy i can twist it as i'm doing here and i and it and let it go and it and it falls back into place and then what about how we attach the wire to the bait to the i mean to the rig or to the swivel yeah i use what's called a figure eight knot um, I've been, I tie my own rigs so that I can adjust them to the different baits that I'm using where, you know, uh, my tail hook sticking back behind them. Uh, and it's called a figure eight knot. So here's a surprise. I don't tie a lot of my own rigs. I mean, I'm going to catch you off guard with that statement, <laughs> but I can go, I can go to the tackle shop and I can buy them already rigged already to the swivel. And all I got to do is tie my mono to the swivel. 
these rigs are widely available uh, at all the tackle shops. Uh, Blue Water Candy makes their own rigs. They make an excellent rig. It's it's ready to go. Comes in a little package. You can buy a whole bunch of them in a package of of I think five or six. So you know uh, you want to go out there. You want to probably have a dozen rigs uh, because you know you'll get bite offs. You'll lose fish, and you know you want to have some different colors. You know, don't just go out there with the the colors that I say because you know everybody likes colors. So that's why they have a whole aisle and a tackle shop full of uh, different color skirts and and uh, stuff. But for the wreck angler listening to this, thinking I'm going to go out and try this, at least a dozen on the boat when you head out. I mean, if you're going to go out that far and spend that money on gas, you don't want to run out of rigs. You think a dozen puts you... A dozen at least puts you in the in the thing where you're going to get in some, you know, you'll get in some fish and you'll get in some time. Uh, and, you know, you're not going to be left in the, uh, in the dark, you know, ho- hopefully by the time you get it, you've got a dozen uh, you've got some fish on the boat and you're able to, uh, you know, head in and with, with a good catch. Is a king on a rig, is that a deal breaker for the rig? Or are you able to use a rig on another fish? So that's one of the other reasons I like the braided malt line is because you can use it on another fish. Uh, sometimes with the single strand wire, when you catch one fish, it's usually it gets kinked or something like that. Okay. Man, uh, if you've got final thoughts on rigs, Again, I, I I don't want to move too quickly, or we can go to I guess the downrigger application. Of this, yeah. So the downrigger is for me for dead bait or live bait fishing is uh, essential. Uh, when you're when you fish uh, near structure near anything like that, you know not everything lives on the surface. You want to be able to get down. So I always bring, I always fish a downrigger when I'm doing any sort of king mackerel bait fishing. Uh, I like to, I use one pound, I use a 10 pound weight. I don't use a lighter weight because sometimes we're trolling up, you know, up around three knots and with a heavier, with a lighter weight, you'll sometimes get, it won't stay straight up and down. I want that, that, that weight to be as straight up and down as possible. So I can control the depth on a downrigger a lot better. And it, to me, it's one of the most essential items uh, for any sort of dead bait or live bait king mackerel fishing because it gives you the, abel- the ability to get down to the fish. You might be marking fish down at 40 feet, and if you've got everything up at the upper five to six feet of water, those fish might not want to come. There might be a thermocline. There might be something that's holding those fish down there that, or they might be, that's where the bait is. So why am I going to go leave the, the dinner table to go swim up when I've got the dinner in front of me? So you want to be able to get down to where the fish are. And the other thing too, a lot of times when uh, you get a downrigger bite and that fish starts streaking off, the other fish in the school will sometimes see that and a lot of times they'll go and attack the other lines because now all of a sudden you've triggered the uh, the feeding response. And you know when fish see one fish get eaten, a lot of eat, get eat. They want to eat too, so that brings them in. That's why you want to have you know that's something to get those fish started up there. So, all right. So on the downrigger, um, I think I'll start my question with this: like if we get out there and we're just beginning our, our troll, we're just beginning to move around. And so we haven't yet marked fish. We haven't yet marked bait. So we're blind, I guess, for lack of a better word. And we're in say 60 feet of water. And so you don't have a mark to go with to where you're going to start that downrigger. Where do you start that downrigger? Typically when you're in say 60 feet of water, probably about 40 feet. 40 Why is to that? 45 feet. I want to go where, uh, I, I can usually see how, the water clarity is, but I want to get something where I'm going to be able to get those fish that are down close to the bottom. And then, you know, also those baits that we're going to be using, they're going to be working in, like they said, that five, maybe 10 foot range up top. So you're covering a little bit more water that way by putting it down to about 40 feet. Okay. And then if I mark bait at 20, do you bring the downrigger up or do you keep it down at 40? I'll usually keep it down at 40 
because my baits up top are probably going to be working within a, a reasonable amount of uh, depth where the fish are going to be seeing it. Um, you know, that you, you don't want to have that, you know, you, you want to get something to maybe get like a different fish or, uh, you know, a, a fish that's not up in the school. Uh, you could be maybe catch, you know, there's something else hanging out down there like a cobia, a mahi, you know, a lot of times when you're doing this, you know, you might be marking some fish up near the top, you know, you never know what's down near the bottom. So I like to keep something down there. So uh, we're covering more water column. So if, if we're in 60 feet of water and you have that downrigger at 40, what scenario would happen to where you would change the depth? If I'm marking the bait closer to the bottom, if I'm marking the fish closer to the bottom, I might drop it down to say 50 feet. Uh, cause maybe down there, the water clarity isn't good enough. If I don't see that I'm getting the bites, but I'm marking bait down in that area. I want to get it so that it's closer to where the fish are. If I'm marking that bait, like down, say 50, you know, 55 feet because fish feed looking up. So I don't want to, I want to get something down there so that it's closer to them. You might, there might be something down there. The water might be a little dirty. The water might, you know, might be blended there. So I want to get it. So maybe I got a little bit closer to where the fish are. If you're in 60 feet of water, is there any scenario that causes you to bring the downrigger up closer to the surface? If I'm getting a lot more bites up high, uh, you know, if I'm really getting bit high, I'll sometimes bring the downrigger up, but I gen generally try to keep it down just because I find that, uh, you know, I just like having a bait down there. It's not, you know, if I got three, I'm fishing usually four lines. If I've got three lines up top and I'm getting hit on three lines and this one isn't getting hit, you know, all of a sudden if the fish decide to go off the feed or something like that, now all of a sudden my downrigger gets hit, uh, you know, so I want to have it so I'm not like, uh, you know, sort of i want to keep everything down there so it so it stays in the in the in the strike zone and you know i don't want to get it at all and also the downrigger is uh can be a little bit uh tricky for a lot of people so i like to keep it down there as much as i can all right so this is a good you just gave me a great opportunity for a, a real segue not a lazy segue but a real segue so dead bait fishing for king mackerel is designed to be easy, give you more fishing time, because I think a lot of people struggle with, you know, catching live bait and, you know, that can ruin a day. It can eat into a day. So part of this is the easiness of it. So four lines sounds like a reasonable expectation, three to four lines for, you know, general recreational angler. So t what, if one of them is the downrigger, what are the other two or what are the other three? So, uh, the other three would be, uh, on your, on one side of the boat, usually you have a, you have a, usually you have a, uh, a rod holder that's at the stern of your boat. Uh, they'll, I'll put one and I'll usually put that one really close. I'll usually put it say 20 feet behind the boat. I want it like in that prop wash. And usually I'll use something like a rubber band or something to hold it close to the boat so that it works like a, it works like a release clip and gives the fish a little bit of time to get that line, that bait in its mouth before it uh, takes off. But I like that one up there it sort of hides in the, in the uh, prop wash uh, on my boat, on a lot of boats that have T tops, they have uh, rod holders set off, uh, at like about a 70 degree angle on the sides of their t-top those are where i put my other two rods and i set them back usually i'll set one back uh say uh a 15 count and i do everything with a count instead of trying to like set it back a certain distance and maybe i'll do the other one a 25 count and my counts are like one two if you want to do one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, just something so that when I turn, everything turns and doesn't foul the other stuff. So I set that something like that so that I can, uh, you know, get different things. Uh, sometimes the fish, they you pass over the fish and they don't come straight up. So you might have passed over the fish 100 yards back and all of a sudden your top rod goes off because those fish have to come up and they can't 
go straight up. They're just like people, they get the bends if they come up too fast. So sometimes, yeah, if you ever, you know, if you do a lot of bottom fishing, when you catch a, a bottom fish that you bring up fast, how they have their stomachs out or their eyeballs bulged. I mean, that's basically the. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Yeah. You, you yeah. read my reaction to that comment. <laughs> so, but yeah, you know, the fish there, you know, you might pull a fish that you, you know, you might be get the bite and you look down at your screen and you're like, uh, I got nothing. Well, uh, when I'm running any type of trolling, I'm always have my, uh, my track on my GPS on so that if I get bit, I can come back and I can go back right to that spot and come back you know, follow my track back to that spot. Okay. And when you're with this four bait spread, how much variety do you have in what you're pulling? Are, you know, are you mixing your colors? Are you mixing your flash? Are you even mixing your bait choices? I usually use one type of bait. Uh, and we'll talk about that real quick. Uh, my favorite bait is a cigar dead cigar minnows they're the most hardy they swim the best uh they stay on the hook the best uh second if you can't get them it would be like a northern mackerel uh they they're they're they'll they'll hold together on the hook pretty good uh you know the last one is like a spanish sardine they're not as uh durable but the best one is a, uh, a cigar minnow and that's usually what I'll fish is cigar minnows on all for the, for the dead bait. Uh, I usually fish a, a green uh, skirt on one side on my T-top. I'll fish a pink on my other side. Uh, I'll fish a pink on my downrigger almost exclusively. It's just, that's my thing. And then the one that's in the prop wash, the one that I've got up there on the, right off the back of the boat, that's the one that I'll try, like whatever, a green, I'll try a, a purple, just something just to see if that's uh, throws everything off because a lot of times you might have all this spread out and you're getting bit all on pinks and then the biggest fish of the day bites that purple one. So just might be something that, you know, a little bit different. Sometimes that will give a reaction strike where the other ones just don't. All right. And on that, so now I'm going to do follow-up questions on the spread. Um, one question I didn't ask was how far back from where you attach to the downrigger ball is that downrigger bait? Is that 20 usually, feet, 30 usually feet? about 25 to 30 feet. Okay. So that's pretty standard and that's down 40. And when you set out your spread, you put the downrigger out first. Absolutely. And then what is the order following the downrigger? Then I'll put my short bait out. Then I put my long bait out and then I put my, uh, I should say my short rigger bait and my short, my long rigger bait. I put those out next and then I put my, my close in one out last. Close in one out last. Okay. And we're setting the drag just as light as it can be. Like help, help us out in that category as well. Okay. So if you're using say 15 pound test line, you want to set your drag usually about three pounds max maybe with 20 pound, four pounds max, which is pretty loose. Uh, you don't want to do like the standard where people might tell you a third or something like that. Uh, three to four pounds is really plenty of drag. Um, how do I figure out what three to four pounds of drag is? You can get a scale or, uh, you know, you can pull it out where it's, it's hard to say, you know, it's something that it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of feeling. Uh, I don't know how to really, I just, I, I get a feeling for it. And if you put it out two pounds, it's not going to be that bad. It's, you just don't want it where you want it to where when you put a, a little bit of bend in the rod, it starts to slip. Okay. Because, you know, the guy who's not tying his own rigs is probably not using a scale to check my drag settings. Yeah. Um, let me see. I don't know if I can really give you, but like, that's too heavy. That's, uh, probably, uh, you know, probably about five pounds of drag right there, but it's just really, it's like, a it's still a little bit heavy, but <laughs> That's probably about right, right there. It's, you see, it's you know, it's not something that you can really tell. It's something that uh, you know, maybe you feel it off the off the tip, but you know, I'm holding the line. 
That's not going to help much. Hold, hold I'm get, I changed my answer. I'm going to get a scale. I'm going to actually get a scale. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get a scale. But you see, if you, if you take a look, you see how my rod bent and now it's slipping. That's about where you want to be. Unfortunately, Captain Savella, they can't see the rod. The rod was not in that shot, but that's okay. The people listening to the podcast are shaking their head already anyway. <laughs> Man, this is good. I mean, just to say, we have a long history together. I'm not <laughs> mouthing off. I'm not mouthing off to someone I just met and invited to do the podcast. We've known each other about 17 years. Um, <laughs> so what was I going to say? All right. So cigar minnows are it. You have that spread. What about, what about pace? Like how fast are we trolling? Okay. With the dead bait, that's another thing you control from literally just in gear, just going really, really slow, uh, up to about three knots. Um, where you know, if you pull the dead bait three knots, you drown them. So you can you can do a little bit more. Usually, uh, when I say dead slow, it's just bumped in gear and just pulling really, really slow, and then up to like say three knots on your uh, on your fish finder gps and if i don't like choices if i just want you to tell me one number that number would be how fast bump it into gear and just go as slow as you can okay that's the standard yeah i mean you know with the asterisk saying you can always experiment you can cover more ground or maybe the fish want something different but a, a good starting just to follow the sabelle advice is bump it into gear go slow bump it into gear go slow sometimes that gets tough if you're in a little bit heavier sea conditions, uh, a little bit more wind. Sometimes you got to give it a little bit more so that you're actually moving. All right. And are we trolling around like figure eight? And like, I guess it depends on where we're fishing. And, you know, so I like to do circles, uh, like a racetrack pattern. Uh, a figure eight uh, is if you're trying to stay tight in a little area but when you're going slow it's really really hard to do that figure eight so you probably want to do something more like a racetrack or an oval type pattern and and so you're going the racetrack pattern and that's just covering a certain ground i mean i guess we i guess this is where we transition into a little bit about where and when i mean that was in our show notes so maybe this is the right time to do that so where uh any sort of bottom structure, uh, reefs, ledges, anything from like, say, they were out in 45 feet of water on Tuesday. Uh, so anywhere in 45 to like 100 feet. I mean, you know, this is something that the small boat guy can do. So anywhere from, say, four to 15 miles in like a, a standard day this time of the year. Uh, usually they start to sh you want to start doing it when they show up in numbers in a certain area uh, so that you you can you can go slow and have a chance to get on the fish uh, not when they're transiting like in the, in the early spring so what I would say is this is something where you get it in the summertime into like the fall summertime into the fall and that and again if I'm just imagining, the angler who's going to listen to this and try to employ it, I'm just going to imagine that, you know, they would be most comfortable staying within 20, 25 mm -hmm. miles. Yeah. And that's easily the realm we're talking about for summer, fall Kings with dead bait. Absolutely. Uh, like I said, two days ago, they were out, uh, 48 feet of water. They're not, you know, and then they'll stay in that 40 to 60 foot of water all summer long into, almost on the, to Thanksgiving. So you don't have to go, you know, as far as you, you know, you can stay in close and get a plenty of chance of catching King mackerel. All right. I think we're going to finish this podcast with talking about how you orchestrate the back of the boat once you get a bite. Okay. So if I get a downrigger bite. Yes. Okay. That's the one that I, I, I have the, the biggest thing. I, I tell the people, the first thing that they do is don't touch the rod, let the fish run. We're going to continue on trolling for 
you know, a few minutes before I even like maybe, you know, a minute or two before I even start to get into fighting the fish. Because when one fish hits, a lot of times more fish hit. So I want to continue on where I'm doing. You don't know if, if you immediately start bringing stuff in, you don't know if you had a fish that was following the other two baits. You know, I want to get a multiple hookup. It makes it a lot more fun and a lot more uh, chaotic. But uh, if the downrigger is hit, the first thing I tell the people to do is reel up that downrigger ball because I want to get that ball out of the water and into the boat. Let the fish run. And then if uh, we don't get any more bites, uh, if the fish is off to one side and I've got uh, no fish other than that one fish on, I'll bring in the other line on that side. Um, that way I can start fighting the fish. And the way I fight the fish is different than a lot of other people. I'm usually the only person on the boat other than the anglers. So I usually fight the fish off my uh, my my uh, my beam not off the bow a lot okay. of people a lot of people go up to the bow when they fight their fish king fishing uh because they can get away from everything um and keep their lines out but i tend to sit, keep people right next to me because i'm gonna have to go for the gaff and i'm gonna have to take that gaff shot i don't want to have to come off the wheel run up to the front of my boat and then go gaff the fish it's a lot easier for me to fight him from the the one of the beams okay i follow that logic and then uh if the bite does not come on the downrigger. Again, I go for that minute or two, see if I get a bite, and then I'll pop the downrigger myself and hand the I'll hand the rod to a person, whoever is going to be next up or whatever. I'll usually pop the downrigger, the the bait off the downrigger, and reel up the downrigger because, as sure as anything else, if you don't pop that downrigger, that fish is going to get tangled in it. So I want that out of the way and some, and I'll let that bait come up off the downrigger and, you know, when it gets up to the surface, if, uh, if it's in the way, I'll bring it in. If not, I'll leave the baits out because a lot of times there are fish following the first fish that got bit, especially if you, you know, find the right school and you're getting really a lot of bites. Um, that King mackerel that just wants to stay out of range of the gaff, any suggestions on for either the boat driver or the angler on how to, bridge that last gap that sometimes stays out there nerve wrackingly too long? Uh, I just continue to cut them off. I'm usually like at the wheel and I continue with the fish just sits there and is just swimming next to the side of the boat. I'll turn my boat into that fish to try and get him to just get closer to him. And then I'll have the people working them really, really easy, just keeping a lot of pressure you know, as much pressure as the line allows. And I'll just keep on work, having him work that as I cut off his, his, uh, thing. Cause eventually he's going to keep, if, if you keep cutting in front of him, he's going to continue to try and get away. And then eventually he's just going to tire out, especially a big fish. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to try and land a fish too early. Uh, we're not in a tournament. Uh, I use only like a four foot gaff and I just want to have that fish, laid on his side right close by so i can stab him real easy uh i'd rather just fight him out okay man uh i i've exhausted my questions anything obvious or or any follow-ups but certainly i'll give you the last word like how are we going to wrap up this podcast you know uh, anything i didn't set you up to say anything you want to add any final thoughts uh the only thing that uh, i really uh find in this is that uh, it takes a little patience to learn. Once you learn it, you're going to find that this way can, you know, they, you can get out there on the days when you don't, you can't find that bait. You can get out there on the days that you can, uh, you know, it, 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 it gives you a little bit more versatility. It doesn't, you know, and, and in fact, if you see a lot of king fishermen that fish in tournaments and stuff like that, uh, I know a lot of them, they still have a box of cigar minnows on the boat, even if they're trying to tournament fish where they want a live bait, because, you know, it's not always, you can't always find that live bait. So, and so really for the guy getting started, the person getting started, it's as simple as some of those pre-made rigs and a box of cigar minnows thawing them on the run out there. And then really as simple as just that one front hook coming up from the bottom up through the nose or that mouth area. And then letting the, you know, the, 
by your opinion, letting that treble hook dangle, but getting that hook right and getting that fish so that's making good action, I can do out of the gate. Out of the gate. That's fantastic. Yeah. Sabella, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Billy. What is going on, Gary? That's a good episode. Hey, man. Man. Huh? I said that was a great episode. I, I learned a lot. I don't. I've never uh, been kingfishing that much, so I, I've learned a lot. Well, that's the way you want to do it. You want to do a dead bait. Sabella is trying to make it as easy as possible for exactly for people like you. Perfect. He won me. He got me. I'm in. I'm sold. And what is Billy's best takeaway? Um, man, I love uh, I love actionable stuff. I mean, of course, he gave a lot of stuff you can take action on, but I think the one thing in the excitement that maybe you could forget that's a pretty good tip is turn your tracking on that way if you get bit or hooked up you can track back through you know school of fish or wherever you you got bit so i'm not you know i don't own a boat but if i did i was like <laughs> oh yeah that makes sense like when you're trolling tracking trolling tracking and that way you can make your way back to the fish if you get hooked up so yeah man I'm, i've just been a fan more of just the easiest path to help get people to put fish in the boat. Because I mean, I think we make these investments and kind of like kids, man, you know, you don't have to have the epic day, man. You just want some action. And so if we can help people put their first King mackerel, or a couple of King mackerel in the boat, then that's a win. And I think the dead bait strategies is, you know, bridge the bridges that gap. Yeah, man. So, so if you're listening, if you're listening, you're tuned in and, uh, go out there, use some of these tips, use some of these tricks and call Jim. If you're having trouble, he'll take you out on the boat, teach you how it's done. Uh, but then also give us some feedback. Let us know that you're taking this information, you're putting it to work, it's working for you. Because that's why Gary and I do this podcast. I mean, he mentions it every episode is we want you to be on the water, catching more fish more often. And uh, sometimes we don't get to get on the water as much. So if we can help you land more fish that's that's what we're here to do so be sure to let us know that you're doing that and be sure to take care of our sponsors as they've taken care of us so go by and say hey marine warehouse center heard about you on, on the fisherman post podcast and just want to come by and support you and buy you know you don't have to go buy a boat sure we want you to buy a boat they want you to buy a boat but go buy you know buy something for your boat buy an accessory buy some you know tackle or fishing lures i don't know if they still have that little section there in the wilmington store uh, but just go by and support those guys and let them know that we sent you because they, they really make it happen, Gary. And so we really appreciate those guys and, and, and R.A. Hitch. Um, just, you know, and, and Chris over at R.A. Hitch, like, literally called us and said, hey, we, we love the podcast. We want to sponsor it. Uh, so go by the, go, those companies and support them where you can. So, Gary, anything else, man, from you? Or let's wrap this puppy up. Let's wrap this puppy up, man. This, right. this was solid info. It was great, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, Jim, it was great, man. Thank you so much. And we'll see you guys in the next episode. Fisherman's up.